Hi, thank you very much for that intro. And yeah, welcome to my talk, uh, JavaScript Saves the World. And yes, my name's Asim Hussain. You can find me on Twitter everywhere as Jawache. There's my website, asim.dev. And yes, I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. I'm very proud to say that as of Monday this week, I'm now um, managing a new team on green cloud advocacy. So I'm pretty excited about that. And yeah, because I'm, I'm passionate about the climate, I'm passionate about the environment. That's something I've been for a long time. Um, we do all the kind of things you're supposed to do. Recycle. I don't have an electric car yet, but we're, we're working on that. And uh, doing a bunch of other things. I'm very, I try not to use reusable plastics. If you see me in an airport, I'm usually trying to fill one of these things with water before I jump on a flight. So, you know, I care. We, that's what we do. We do in our family. We care about these things. That's my son, Micah, just turned one. Something about this photo, I'm not really too sure, but I think he loves his daddy. Um, and when he was born, I got some really good advice, which was, ask him, do all the nappy changes. Yeah, my wife was breastfeeding, so she'd, help, she'd have that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with him. The rest of the time, he's going to be handed around with all of our relatives. You take the nappy changes. That's your one-on-one -on -one time with your son. And I went, yeah, cool, that's great. Told my wife, she was really excited about it. And then like a week later, she goes, oh, by the way, Asim, um, we're going to use cloth nappies. Not disposable nappies. We can do a shit in a disposable nappy, just chuck it away, a cloth nappy. Now, it's not like maybe what you imagine with just a piece of cloth wrapped around. They are a bit more advanced these days. But fundamentally, you have to deal with shit. OK? A lot of shit. You shit eight times a day. A lot of shit. I got very, very, very used to shit. OK? I'd be in meetings. I'd be on calls. And somebody would go, ask him, what's that on your face? I'd be like, just some shit. Don't worry about it. So I'm used to. Dealing with shit. And I was quite happy to. I'm ha I was happy to do it. I was happy to do that for the environment. I was happy to do it. Then, like, months later, I had this epiphany. I realized I was willing to deal with shit eight times a day, yet I had never, in a single meeting, in a single scrum, in a single architectural discussion, I had never, ever, ever put my hand up and asked, well, what's the greener solution here? I'd argue constantly about improving SEO by 2%, reducing bugs by 4%. Oh my god, the framework wars. Like constant arguments. But I never once had put my hand up and said, well, actually, what's the greener option? And that's a journey I've been on for quite a while. And it's kind of the first question, kind of what does it mean to build a green application? What does it mean to make your application green? Right? And to explain a lot of this stuff, I'm going to have to explain what's going on with climate change and the environment. So first thing to understand, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It gets pumped into the atmosphere. And what it does, it, ha it acts like a blanket, so it traps in heat. Carbon dioxide is the most common greenhouse gas that gets pumped out. But there are others. For instance, methane gets pumped out. Methane has 25 times the heating potential of carbon. But what we do is we normalize everything into what's called carbon dioxide equivalent. So we call one ton of methane, 25 tons of carbon. And that's how we always talk about everything in terms of carbon. Something happened here in this beautiful city in 2016. There was a Paris Climate Agreement where 187 seven states sat and agreed on uh, trying to keep the increase in temperature to two degrees, or ideally one and a half degrees. Um, just FYI, we've already, we've already reached one degree increase since pre-industrial times. So there's not much headroom here. When I saw that, I was like, well, hang on. <laughs> two degrees. Who gives a shit about two degrees? Could you tell a two degree difference? Why is two degrees important? There's a really good website out there called Carbon Brief, <clears throat> 
which collects a lot of information about all the different effects of climate change. And it, what, well, this is one of the slides on their website, and I think it's a particularly interesting one. So this is proportion of species losing 50% of their climatic range. So when you get hot or cold, you just take clothes off or put clothes on. Animal, animals and plants can't do that, they just die. So a one and a half degree increase, you can see it's just single digits. It's not great, but survivable. At two degrees C, you see we're entering the double digit territory. Okay, not great. Four and a half degrees C, we're pretty screwed. It's a non-linear relationship. And the reason why we may be hearing about a lot of this stuff now and kind of the voice is getting louder and louder and louder is frankly, we're just not on track. We're not even remotely on track, okay? We're not, we haven't even reached peak pollution. We're still increasing year by year the amount we're polluting on the planet. We need to start reducing immediately if we want to have a chance of meeting even the two degrees C. A report came out recently from the UN, which is like we're more likely to hit 3.2 by the end of the century. The World Bank claims to have a report that says that four degrees C is a planet that's essentially unlivable. Um, not everything's so depressing. This is what I'm talking to you right now. Because as technologists, you can have an outsized impact. Most people who care about this can only really make changes in their personal lives. You, because of the way, the things that you do, can have an impact on 10, 20, 100, 1,000, million people, all the users of the technology that you create. One of the best ways to have an impact, or the most easiest ways right now for you to have an impact, is to look at electricity. Because the creation of electricity is responsible for 30% of the carbon emissions. And that's because, on average, 80% of the world's electricity is created, or still created, from the burning of fossil fuels. Coal, gas, these things. So the goal, like the one thing I want to ask you to do is just don't waste electricity, okay? We destroyed a little bit of the planet to create some electricity. Don't waste that gift. If you want extra bonus points, use clean energy. Okay, that's energy either renewables or perhaps it's been offset with credits. Um, if you use either Azure or Google Cloud, we're both, Microsoft and Google, we're both carbon neutral firms, which means we have calculated the carbon impact of all of our activities, not just data centers. My flights get calculated, and we pay, it's $15 per ton. It's not enough. We need to be paying $40 to $80, $15 a ton, and we, we put that into projects, which then capture carbon from the atmosphere and put it back down in the ground. It's not guilt-free, but it's better than nothing. If you're using Amazon, only these four regions are carbon neutral, okay? Dublin, Frankfurt, Oregon, and Canada. So if you are on Amazon, try and push your workloads to those regions. How wasteful are our servers? Let's just say you had like some sort of load like this on your application um, over time, and you had like this many servers you've provisioned, or maybe you've bought, or maybe you've spun up with a VM to handle that workload. The red ones, they're just going to be idle. The blue ones are probably going to be 100%, and the yellow ones are going to be somewhere in between. But what does it cost in terms of carbon to run a server? So for an, uh, a specific Dell server, I haven't got it on my screen right now, from 2019, it's about 600 kilograms of carbon, that's the elect electrical cost, if that server was running at 100% for a year. But here's the kicker. Idle servers still consume electricity, even if nothing's running on it. It's between 25 to 50%, depending on the, the reports you look at, or the configurations. So even if a server's doing absolutely nothing in a corner, it's still producing about 150 grams of carbon a year, kilograms of carbon a year. Also, the server itself, when it was created, created pollution. The actual act of creating servers creates carbon. Uh, for this particular server, we assume it's got a four-year lifespan. And even if it's sat in a box, unboxed, you can still say it's producing 320 kilograms of carbon a year. So an idle server 
almost half a ton just sitting there. You're wasting it. You're wasting it. So how can serverless help? Okay, and kind of what the hell is serverless anyway? So serverless is um, a way of uh, executing little bits of code, little atomic units of, of code based on some thing. Like this is one example would be, let's say a URL gets executed, you just uh, hit, we execute a unit of code. You just give a serverless provider just that atomic little bit of code, not the framework, nothing else, just that little endpoint. And by doing that, what you do is you give the, the provider, uh, we basically do the auto scaling. It's all pay as you go. So you don't have to predict the number of servers. All that happens at the end of the month, we figure out how much you used, and we just charge you. Right? And if you use zero, you pay zero. And the unit of measurement is not servers. You don't think about servers. Servers are not on your mind. So for a bunch of us, a bunch of them, including ours, we just charge you for the amount of memory that you use and how long your functions took, and that's it, right? So this is basically what happens with your serverless architecture, is that um, you just get exactly the right amount of compute to execute exactly what you need to execute, right? It's no waste. How can we do that? Well, we can do that because we're Microsoft, and Amazon can do it because Amazon's Amazon, and Google can do it because Google's Google, right? We basically have a whole bunch of servers, and your code is going to get executed on the same server as my code is going to get exe executed on. So we can utilize all the servers at 100%, no waste. Right? So that's what it's all about. Serverless are greener. Serverless is greener. This is an interesting thing to go. Serverless is greener because carbon was released to create the server. Carbon was released to power the server. If you don't run at 100% utilization of your servers, then you're wasting carbon. Then you destroyed a little bit of the Earth for nothing. Um, and that's why serverless, I think, quite interesting in this space, because it lets you run servers, or lets us run servers at 100%. So there, how do you do serverless in Node.js? OK, so there's a bunch of different things. They're all very provider-specific. Um, so with Microsoft, we've got something called Azure Functions. If you're using Amazon, the famous one is Amazon AWS Lambda. If you're using Google, it's Google Cloud Functions. And all of them, to a certain degree, definitely Microsoft, we suffer from, I, I think, kind of an interesting problem, which is when you create an Azure function, this is what it gives you, right? That's it. Now you have to go and build the rest of your application. I know some, of the, some people look at this piece of code and they're like, yeah, cool. No one else's opinions to get in the way of my opinions, the best opinions. I look at this code and I think, man, I've got to have some opinions. I don't want any opinions. I don't want to think of my own opinions. I want to use someone else's opinions. I want to use a framework. Right? And the framework I really like to use is Nest.js. So if you don't know Nest.js, Nest.js is the, from GitHub stars, the fastest growing Node.js framework in the world right now. I contacted Camille. I said, hey, let's chat. It'd be really great if Nest.js worked a little bit better with serverless um, technologies. And he said, sure. And we worked on a couple of things together. So if you want to do, you can, you can build a Nest application. Nest is a beautiful CLI, so you can kind of create an application and scaffold it and run it locally. Let's say you want to make it serverless. All you have to do now is nest add this package. What this does, um, it does an npm install underneath for that package. But the reason you use nest add is the nest CLI uses something called schematics. It's based off the Angular CLI. And what that allows you to do is analyze all of your code and make a whole load of changes for you automatically. Not just, you know, you can add files, you can change files, you can add imports. Like the Angular CLI uses it a lot when you do upgrades. You can do ng upgrade and it'll just upgrade all of your code. So when you do that command with Nest, it basically adds or updates 10 files into your Nest project to convert it over into a serverless, um, serverless application that you can just run locally. Um, and try out and debug, and then when you're finally ready to upload, 
I recommend using a tool called Hexa, Hexa Run, it's kind of open source. It's made by one of our team here, uh, Wasim, in Paris, actually. Excuse me. <coughs> and it's really cool, it's like a really opinionated, I like other people's opinions, it's really opinionated CLI that sits on top of other CLIs. Um, and you can do Hexa in it, and then basically initializes everything, then you can deploy it, deploys it up to the cloud. Um, recommend giving that a go. Um, what we've done is, what I've done basically, is all of this stuff, in terms of how to do Nest.js with serverless, Rhino only with Azure, um, we've kind of combined all that together into just some documentation, which we call Nitro, and yes, some stickers. So you can find out, you can get more of those stickers later on. Um, if you want to solve the same problem, you can do that's all with the Azure. If you want to solve the same problem with Google Cloud Functions, you can. It's all, it's all serverless. I recommend taking a snapshot of this as a really good guide for doing Nest.js serverless on Google Cloud Functions. And if you want to do it on AWS Lambda, again, this is another guide to do the same problem, solve the same problem on AWS Lambda. So take a snap of that, and I'll take you through it step by step. Um, so just to summarize, um, servers release carbon. Release carbon into the atmosphere. Um, serverless is just, is just more efficient. It creates less waste. Okay, we don't waste that opportunity that we have. We don't waste that gift. Um, if you want to do serverless on Net with Nest.js on Azure, check out Nitro. Um, extra points for clean energy. Okay. Ideally, renewables, if you can get to renewables, but carbon offset uh, uh, data centers are really, really good as well, or a good uh, compromise. Um, and if you want if to, I've, if I've empowered you to do more in this space, I recommend joining this community, Climate Action Tech. I'm one of the organizers of this community. And, if you, and I want to I wanna speak to you if you care about this stuff. If you've got any questions, you can come reach out to me there, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm listening. Thank you very much for your time.